And we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Stephen. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we have an interview lined up with Stephen's absolute favorite podcast host talking about plant stuff. Yes, the great Jane Perrone. We talked to her about kind of a range of issues, and we ended in an awesome question. Um, any plants that she hates? And <laughs> she definitely had one to name without hesitation. It's going to be a bombshell. Yeah. So, although if you listen to her show, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, we'll get back to that in just a minute. Um we haven't talked about our plant updates in a while, Stephen. Uh, what have you got going on? We're kind of in a seasonal transition, so there should be quite a few things to note. Yeah, so I'm definitely bringing in my stuff from my balcony right now. I am spraying things down for bugs. I had a bit of an aphid infestation this summer, and unfortunately I have aphids on one of my most treasured plants, my Drosera regia, the King Sundew. And I just want to note the irony that a carnivorous plant I know. is being like bugged out with aphids. Yeah, this is a tough one because um, they are a bit more sensitive plants. So I had to really do my research, see what kind of uh, insecticide would work for this. I tried just picking these off at first with alcohol and it really has a lot of folds. If you know these plants, like there's a lot of places for them to hide. So I'm now treating it with an insecticide, uh, keeping it outside. It's kind of I don't see it helping yet. Um, the plant seems fine though, so I think I have a little bit more time to, to kind of work on this. Anyway, that's one of the things um, I'm kind of dealing with as I bring my stuff inside. Um, as far as the indoor plants goes, my Stefania erecta, um, I have a lot of leaves on it now. It has kind of a long vine. Um, I think it looks really good, but now I'm kind of like, now what? Uh, maybe I'll trellis it? <laughs> Um, maybe I have like a month with it and then it's going to do go dormant. I don't really know from here. The leaves are real cute, but they're like the size of pennies rather than silver dollars. Yeah, they're not huge. It's growing kind of into the light that I have right now. I wonder if they will get bigger at that part of the vine. I'm not really sure. Matthew, you chopped yours kind of. Yeah. So one of our Instagram friends, uh, had an accident with her plant. She knocked it over broke the growing point off and then just like potted it back up, got it going again. And it's sort of growing very happily without any issue. So mm -hmm. I went ahead and just took a page out of her book and decided one day I'm just going to cut this shit off. So I had <laughs> one really long vine that had like one or two leaves forming. They weren't very large or impressive. I was growing it under higher light than I had been previously. And... After I cut it off, I just put it under some grow lights with my orchids. The humidity is high. The temperatures are high. And within days, like it had multiple new sprouts coming out, uh, which was really promising. And now it's been a couple of weeks and that new sprout that it grew, one of them has really taken off and is getting maybe Did, like four or five inches tall by now. Does it have leaves? Yeah, it's actually, they're not mature, but they're growing at the moment. Okay. And I expect that I'm actually going to have like... A less lanky, loose, floppy, mm. viney plant with no leaves, and I might actually get something that's more shrubby, upright with leaves. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, so, have any other plant updates? Yeah. So, I've kind of been like patiently watching my Anthurium clarinervium. I have two of them. One of them is mature and it has two large leaves. I potted it up recently, so it's establishing itself. It's not putting out any foliar growth yet, but it's doing well. But a little baby that I got, it was just a little plug growing in sphagnum. I was kind of being overly precious with it at first because it had one large new leaf that it had grown uh, in the nursery. And when I received it, that new leaf was beautiful. And then it just like flopped over and died like 24 hours after I opened mm. it out of the mail because just new growth is tender and a baby plant is sensitive and my humidity isn't the same as a greenhouse, etc. Yeah. So I was okay with that. I potted it up in a closed bottom vessel and I just took the whole sphagnum plug, put it in with a whole bunch of clay pellets surrounding it. So then I just fill it up with water every now and then. The water wicks into the sphagnum moss and so all the roots are growing out into the expanded clay pellets. 
And I've unpotted it like once, I think, just to kind of like get an eye on how it was doing, whether I needed to change its cultural conditions. And it had a lot of new roots growing. So I put it back and have been like patiently watching it. Since that point, I saw some new roots that were beginning to grow towards the top where you could visibly see them without unpotting it. Wait, so is this the same plant that you ordered? Well, I ordered this one online. Um, I don't remember if it was eBay or Etsy. Mm -hmm. It's different from the one that I bought at the plant store oh. down in White Center. But it has now grown enough new roots that it feels really secure. And it actually has a new baby leaf that popped out a couple of days ago and it's beginning to unfurl. It's not going to be a mature leaf yet because it's still like a little baby in its juvenile form, but it's promising. And it looks like there's another dormant growth point that was below um, like the, the main active one that's beginning to activate now. So this plant might actually turn out to be something that's pretty nice. Hmm. Then I also am really excited because I just got my hands on a philodendron gloriosum, which without any irony, I told Stephen earlier that it was absolutely glorious Hence the Latin name. Mm -hmm. um, I can totally see why they named it that now. Uh, it has dark green velvety leaves that look like they've been painted. And the veining on the leaves is like crystally white. And so it has this really beautiful texture to it. And it's a great philodendron to grow indoors. They're apparently very easy and really undemanding. And what I like about it is that instead of being a climbing philodendron or a vining one, like a lot of the ones that are very popular right now, and uh, kind of need moss poles or something to grow up so that you get their, their best leaf form, this one scrambles along the forest floor. So it likes fairly low light, which is great, and it has short inner nodes of a rhizome that just creeps along the soil surface. So I'm never gonna have to worry about getting it to climb so that I can see its best mm -hmm. leaves. It's not gonna like hang out over the sides of the pot and kind of go crazy. It's a little bit less easy to propagate that way because you don't have like tons of excess vine regularly, but it has three healthy leaves, two new shoots, one of which seems that it's going to put out a new leaf, leaf pretty soon, and it's really beautiful and I'm really excited. I've wanted this plant for years. Nice. And then the last thing that I'm going to mention, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Steven's just rolling his eyes I'm going to look at the clock. Yeah. Um, I also ordered a Platycerium ridleyi, which is my favorite species of staghorn fern. It's one that's rarer than a lot of the versions you see in shops. Yeah, this one looks pretty interesting, actually. Yeah. I this, agree with This you. is one that you'll identify just being able to look at it. What I love about this plant is that its fertile fronds are like really branched. They kind of look like moose antlers and they stand stiff and upright. The part that produces spores is on like a separate spoon shaped part of the leaf. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how that works. But maybe the coolest part is that it's basal shield fronds kind of have like this like ripply waffly looking texture to them, kind of like a cabbage. And they tend to grow into like a, a ball shape so that instead of the shield fronds just kind of going flush against the surface like the ones that we're familiar with in cultivation mm -hmm. um it actually produces like these chambers inside that are colonized by ants so it's kind of a symbiotic species that forms a relationship oh, with ants yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so with an ant colony that moves in they produce like nutrients and waste that the fern uh, likes and the fern gets like, not a parasite, but like a symbiotic uh, mm -hmm. partner who yeah. will defend it and keep it safe because that's where they're living. Yeah, this is a really interesting um, sort of symbiotic thing that a lot of plant species have actually. It's a surprising yeah. number to me. This could be an interesting future show idea. Yeah, now I have had one of these ferns before. I bought like a very small baby on Etsy or eBay. I think it was eBay a while ago. And it didn't do well. I think it was just kind of small enough that the shock of transfer killed it off. So I wasn't able to revive it, get it to grow. So this is a larger plant. Hopefully it'll be more resilient. And I think I'm going to try to do it as a kokodama ball where I'm going to mount it in its own like sphere of sphagnum moss mm -hmm. with a PVC pipe in the center that's capped off on an end and little holes drilled in so that I can water directly into the center of the ball and use that as a point to hang it and then okay. get like a really beautiful form uh, and hopefully that'll do well. Awesome. 
So before we dive into our interview, I just want to remind everybody that we can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest as Plant Daddy Podcast, and online at plantdaddypodcast.com. You can also contact us by email at plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com, and we would love it if you could go rate and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts, because this helps others find us too. Okay, so here's our interview with Jane, where we discuss her love of plants, where it started, her favorite things to grow, the plants that give her trouble, and the plants that she absolutely hates. That's my favorite yes, part. Uh, I like that too. Okay. Here, here it goes. Today we have Jane Perrone on, and she has one of our absolute favorite podcasts. It is called On the Ledge, and you can find great resources on her Instagram and on her website. It's yeah. a joy to have you here, I'm so sure. welcome, Jane. I'm sure everyone Thank knows you. her. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Thank you to be here. Yeah. Before we dive into talking about our topic today, I want you to just kind of introduce yourself to our listeners and let them know how you got interested in plants, where that started with you, and where that puts you today. Okay, so um, oh, I'm based in the in the UK. In case you hadn't guessed from my cut glass English accent, um, <laughs> I so yes, yeah, so I'm a lifelong houseplant person. I mean, I think I was probably about I don't know five when I first started growing plants and getting into I don't know having cacti and succulents, get, picking them up. And I just have I can remember so clearly going to this car boot sale at a hospital. And there was an, a big table of cacti and succulents and I was really quite little and just going absolutely nuts and like buying all these cacti and succulents. And I know I remember one of them was the Cal and Co. Um, Mother of Millions, the one that has all the babies yeah. along the edge of the leaf and just being so excited about that. And so from a really young age, I just was it wasn't anything anyone foisted upon me. It was just a natural thing that I just love plants. So that's, you know, what fast forward 40 years and here I am. And it's quite satisfying, really, that now something that was seen as a little bit a little bit niche is now very much mainstream. And I, I just wish that I still had some of those plants from my childhood. Uh, your collection waxes and wanes. But yeah, so that's why I started a podcast, just because. My family didn't want to hear about my me waffling on about plants, so I just thought I <sighs> we know about that. Yeah, yeah, we we have deliberately between us made this little pack that we're going to save our plant talk for the podcast and not bore our friends with it anymore. <laughs> yes, yeah. this is so good. this is good. Tell me about some of your favorite plants in your collection. Like, what are the things that really make you tick? Well, I mean, I guess I'm a bit of a, an oddball in that I love the Gesneriad family of plants. So that's mm. things, I mean, I, actually, funnily enough, the one Gisneria that I'm not that keen on is African Violets, St. Paulias. Uh, but I do love um, Streptocarpus, Petrocosmia, Primulina and Smithiantha. I absolutely adore. And I just cannot understand why everyone's not growing these plants because they're so awesome. So I love growing those. And the trouble is they're quite actually not that easy to get your hands on here in the UK. Um mm. So I've kind of been stalking on eBay and buying some tiny little Smithiantha rhizomes and growing those. And there is one supplier here in the UK called Dibley's who I regularly order from as well. So Gisneriads I love. I'm also seriously into Hoyas these days and um, have a, 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 probably I need to look on my little app that I've got for recording all these things. I think I've got about 10 Hoyas now. They're all quite small still. Uh, but I just think they're such a cool group of plants and so varied yeah. and, and wonderful. So Hoyas and then cacti and succulents have always been into, as, as I've already said. Uh, but I am in the nature of me is that I'm never going to be a completist. I'm never going to want to have one of one single species or genus. I do mm -hmm. tend to be drawn to something inexplicably and then end up growing it. And it doesn't help making a podcast about plants because obviously, you know, I do a palm ev episode and I want every palm. I do, uh, you know, yeah. A, yeah. a Nepenthes episode and I want loads of Nepenthes. So that's just a peril of the job. Developing like mini collections within your main collection. <laughs> yeah. So I guess our question here is, you know, you've tried a lot of plants, like you said. Are there any that you haven't had success with that, you know, you just feel like, okay, I'm done with these for now. I think a lot of us have these plants like maybe our friends can grow this super well it's so easy how could you possibly have an issue but maybe are tough for you or you see them at every garden center and feel like well if they're this available 
why aren't they working for me? Well, indeed, yes. I think the Rex Begonias definitely fall into this category. I have bought and attempted to grow many of these and they just always die. And it's heartbreaking every time as it happens. And I'm feeling extra pressure right now because I've just been given... We were talking before we started this interview about the legendary James Wong. And I saw him at this event I was at at the weekend. And he's given me this rare begonia. It's not a Rex begonia, but it's this really super rare begonia. And I'm now slightly, I don't know if this is a clean show, if I'm allowed to say. Uh, you can say whatever you want. I'm now, you I, my show is a clean show, so I'm now shitting myself. Because I'm thinking, oh my God, this rare begonia. And um, so I'm going to have to put it in a terrarium and yeah it's it's hardcore but but rex begonias i've I, i've had success for a few months and then they just go downhill i've That's been desperate to get a begonia true. expert on the show to try to tap them for info but it is a plant that i will keep trying with but i just feel like i can't quite get it right and then also ferns i mean i've grown a lot of ferns over the years and never quite got that right i tend to be quite mean with the watering on the whole and so things that suit me are things like hoyas and gazneriads which tend to be quite happy to dry out in between waterings i'm good at that but i'm not good at that kind of constant supply of moisture thing so that's indicates where i fail with plants hearing you mention both of those those are like literally the top two in my list. Yeah, I have a begonia sitting on my counter right now. I just got it. Uh, my mom gave it back to me, if that's any indication, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I feel a personal challenge to keep this alive, hopefully. But I've had the exact same experience as you. I mean, a couple months it'll work out. Now, and the funny thing about this particular begonia is that it is, I think it's called Red Robin. It's a really beautiful Rex begonia that has black and red modeling on the leaves. And a friend of ours who has a local plant store in the Seattle area, he actually propagated it himself from like some leaf pullings. He gave it to me and I struggled with it for a while. So I gave it to Steven who yeah. struggled with it for a while. He gave it to his mom yeah. who somehow kept it pretty so, okay. So I guess what we're saying is that we're going to send this to you soon, Jane. Okay. And you're expected to keep this alive. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to hearing about it. Oh yeah. my gosh. The pressure. Well, I would say the one begonia, and it's not a Rex begonia, but the one begonia that loves me and does very well in my house is the beef steak begonia, begonia erythrosa. Um, it's oh, quite yeah. a succulent, fleshy one. And that I've got it in an, a pot with no drainage, and it's living with about two, it's living with two other plants. It's living with. Um, Oh uh, gosh, what's the what's the English what's the Latin name? Uh, the one that's called Pussy Ears, I think, Cyanotis somaliensis, mm, and okay. some kind of pe Pelionia, which isn't doing very well. But it's amazing that plant is um, seriously uh, loving my conditions. So that's the one begonia that I've had great success with. But yeah, I've seen um, it. it's really beautiful. Yeah, it's it's. I guess that's the thing is that sometimes you just have to try something, and it may be officially the wrong thing for a plant, but you just find that it works for your particular plant, and so you just go along with it and ignore the traditional advice if it's working for you. So the beefsteak tomato is, or <laughs> the beefsteak begonia, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, is that a variety that grows rhizomaceously? That's a really good question. Uh, it is it. A, uh, I want to say no, that it's I, not. I, I it's okay. not exactly. It it it's almost like a trailing trailing habit. Like it, I've seen it growing oh. in, a, in a brilliant garden center here, um, and it's in a hanging basket, and it just ends up as this massive um, sort of ball. And I don't really know what what how you'd classify it in the world of begonias. Because, as you say, normally yeah. it's rhizomatous or rex or cane. And I don't think it really fits into any of those categories. I'm going to have to look that up. I've... Maybe it's one of those <laughs> Sorry, big categories, like trailing scadent. Like, there's a yeah, begonia be a... called Begonia solenanthera, which is a Brazilian species, is one that I'm struggling with. And I have it under some orchid lights, and I'm keeping it pretty well watered, and it's finally doing okay but it just has the most beautiful kind of trailing habit. Like that's one that I think is actually like a quality begonia, but I agree the Rex and the rhizomaceous ones just present obstacles in every direction. Yeah, I think, yeah. we, I think we, have a, we have a begonia support group going here. Yeah. Don't we? 
Yeah, so. <laughs> I, it's 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 um it's. Tra- I mean, that that said, I've been growing some outdoor bedding begonias this year outside, which I would never normally grow, but somebody sent them, some company sent them to me for free, and okay. actually they've been quite good. They're, they've been they've been there. I've just decided to go all out with that's actually worked out quite well but um yes i'm not sure where, <laughs> there's not there's not much design to it but it's very colorful but they've done well there but i'm not sure what i'm going to do with them at the end of the year other than stick them on the compost heap maybe take some cuttings before you compost yeah. the rest <laughs> so you also struggle with burns just like we do are there any that you found that perform well for you and succeed in your home well, I think you've got to cheat here and and grow something that's not actually a fern, but it's called a fern, which is the asparagus fern. Um, has the ferny qualities, but doesn't actually um, have the diva-like qualities of, of a maiden hair or a, uh, one of those. Other, or you know, but I find Boston ferns difficult to grow even. So I like the asparagus ferns because they're just really, really tough, and but they have that kind of ferny look, which makes them very, very appealing. Uh, but they're just super super tough house plants and i i really love those um yeah i have i've had ferns over the years but there was one which uh i i was very happy that it got a terrible scale infestation because i just thought mm-hmm. i can't deal oh. with this it's just too <laughs> severe so it, it had to go on the compost heap and i was kind of almost happy about that because it was so stressful to keep seeing it sort of going brown and crispy and then reviving and then going brown and crispy again so yeah, sometimes yeah. it's a good relief. But yeah, no, um, I'm trying to think of any. I don't think I've had any fern that's lasted longer than a couple of years. I did have a beautiful platycerium, which is this is a tragic story. That's probably the only fern, the staghorn fern, that I've been really successful with. And I had a gorgeous one, and I killed it by this time of year actually forgetting that it was outside and it was an unexpected hard frost, and I killed it that way. That was gutting. Oh no. <laughs> But those, okay. I mean, until until I did that, I was quite successful at growing that. That seemed to be okay. But obviously, that's a slightly different category. The platycerium is my absolute favorite indoor fern because I've not run into any of the issues that I have with literally every other fern. Uh, but perhaps like the bird's nest fern, the Asplendium nidus, I believe. Uh, yep. That's one that I've had success with. But mm. yeah, it's nice to hear that I'm not the only one who cannot keep a maidenhair fern looking decent. Well, I've just heard so much advice. I've, you know, talked about it on the show. and But I just, I don't think I care. At the end of the day, I don't think I care enough. Like, I, that's the thing. I think if you really love maidenhair ferns and you just love everything about them, but I'm just not a fern person, if I can put it that way. So I just, with me, it's all about, does this kind of plant kind of turn me on? Is it making me get excited? And if it's making me get excited, I will put the world's worth of effort into it. So, you know, my my variegated monster of deliciosas yes i am like i'm there i'm misty i'm not misting i don't really miss but i'm i'm wiping yeah. leaves and i'm you know i'm repotting regularly and taking good care of them but um you know that's because they i just find them amazing plants if something's kind of not really doing it for me then it tends to be more likely to go down to the bottom of the list and get ignored and get miserable and so unless it's a really tough plant it probably won't make it now, have you ever found a time where there was a plant that you think is just not going to happen, so you start neglecting it, and then it immediately, at some point, surprises you that it actually starts to thrive? Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 orchids, I, I've always considered myself not to be an orchid person, but I did have, I was given a dendrobium orchid at work um a few years ago when i was working at the guardian and i was kind of like oh no do i have to have this i really don't want it because it's an orchid and i don't do orchids and i let it flower and then i just literally ignored it and i didn't water it and i did nothing to it and then i noticed sort of two months later oh my gosh it's flowering again and um it was kind of just showing me that actually that's exactly what it needed with that period of dormancy and then it came back nicely um i've since um well it's a long story i've ended up looking after this dendrobium orchid for somebody who Hmm. um, i'm not sure if they're ever going to have it back i won't go into the long story about it but the annoying thing is is that their dendrobium orchid is looking way better than my one and I'm thinking, is this because I'm so worried about killing it that I'm actually putting more care into somebody else's plant than I would do my own? So, yeah, that's an inter- interesting psychological profile there. But um... <laughs> 
So do you have any plants that you know you're not going to be able to grow long term and that they're eventually going to die, but that doesn't stop you from regularly getting them? Uh, well, I mean, coleus, I suppose, is or Seleno semnon, semon, as we should probably be calling them. Uh, some of those, I mean, I keep them going with cuttings generally. Um, I have lost a few over the years. I think also streptocarpus are one of those things where they are plants that they're very difficult. They get huge, basically, and then they get unwieldy and they don't fit on my windowsill anymore. And at that point, I kind of do the really brutal thing of literally taking a few leaves and just composting the rest of the plant. And then I had a disastrous incident where basically the I, I lost a load of plants just through stupidity and leaving them in the wrong place. And so I lost a load of streptocarpus. And I always do think of those as being kind of plants that will be with me for a while, but I'll have to propagate regularly to keep them nice. I also think tradescantias are like that. You know, I hate it when mm -hmm. you see a tradescantia that's like one spindly stem because somebody's holding onto it, even though it needs like just totally, you know, it needs major surgery. Um, so that's yeah. another part I think that people just tend to, or, or it'll suddenly go plonk. I mean, I had a lovely Calicia repens pink panther and it was on Instagram and I was like, oh, look at my amazing plant. Isn't this cool? It's got these tiny, tiny pink uh, striped leaves. And then one day, suddenly out of nowhere, the whole thing, it was like, it was like somebody's wig fell off. <laughs> oh, really like came away, and I was like, "Oh, damn! What's happened here?" And then I tried to, I took some cuttings, and the cuttings went wrong. And I was just like, ha "I've gone from like hero to zero in a, a couple of weeks with this plant." So yeah, Tranescantias, I think, can be you know they can be going along really nicely, and then suddenly it all just goes seriously wrong so that's another one that yeah take lots of cuttings regularly if you want to keep them going now do you have anything that you like treat as an annual when you're growing them indoors uh that's a good question i'm just trying to think uh well apart from the coleus not really um i mean i do grow i do usually grow some chilies which will um be treated as annuals although i did have a period a couple of years ago where i was growing um a certain type of chili called a tree chili which I was overwintering indoors because they are ones that you can overwinter. But as the name suggests, they literally did get to the point where they were like small trees <laughs> and I couldn't bring them indoors anymore. So they had to, they had to, um, they had to go. But yeah, I, I will try and grow chilies most years and they'll kind of be possibly inside, possibly outside, depending on the cultivar. Cause some chilies are quite nice and compact and some are enormous. So, um, but yeah, generally most things in my house, uh, are there to stay or or they're being shipped off to somebody else or swapped for something um just because uh otherwise yeah i don't, I don't, don't have a time for a lot of like things that are ephemerals i guess so our last question and you can kind of dish your your deepest thoughts on this one are there any house plants that you just are never going to try that you just hate yes <laughs> i'm just gonna be totally honest. i'm never gonna grow a fiddle leaf fig shocking um, i applaud you jane i am the same I mean, <laughs> Every, why yeah. what is yes. the deal why 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 too, and yeah. they're beautiful and i love them but i, I don't know even that think they're that beautiful i seriously don't, don't i don't either they take up so much room they look crusty all the time they've got, <laughs> they've got these coarse leaves i mean if you want to grow a ficus grow ali eye or grow yeah bengalensis or, or something yeah. like it's but this, the leaves this... are just terrible yeah i i'm actually <laughs> hunting for ficus audrey because uh, it, that's it's a nice so one. much more beautiful yeah yes i haven't yes, come across one in cultivation yet but yeah as as I'm buying it like um, if you want a challenge if you want a challenge you know i mean i think that those those ficus you know if you want to grow one of those bigger ficus like audrey or um, you know, they are a bit more of a challenge and light is, is for some people is going to be a struggle, but you know, grow something beautiful like Audrey, don't grow a fiddle leaf fig because like, you know, I'm just so, I've said this so many times, but you know, fiddle leaf fig in basket, in white room, go away. I never want to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly um, what you're talking don't about. Tell, I don't tell Hilton Carter I said that, but you know, like... <laughs> I just, yeah. I just, I, I, it's just not a plant that's for me. And if you grow it successfully and it looks great, well done. But I, it's not a plant that that turns me on personally. So uh, there you go. That's my smackdown on, yeah. on the fiddle leaf fig. And is that your total list of no go plants? 
you know, we don't, Ooh. yeah, we don't want to expose too much here, right? I, <laughs> <laughs> shit, you can choose yeah, to answer that. You think. Want. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I absolutely wouldn't grow. Yeah, um, you sound like you're interested in so many things. I, I believe you when you say, you know, it's hard to. Well, there, there probably are. There prob I, I do have irrational hatreds of certain things. Uh, um, but I, I, yeah, I'm just trying to think what of, uh, if there's anything else. I mean, I, I've grown palms over the years, but I'm not a big fan of the really big, you know, like the, the really big Kensha palms and things. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of those either you personally. Yeah. yeah, they don't really, they don't make me come alive. Um, but yeah, those are, I, I'll, I'll give most things a go. Those are my probably my only two irrational prejudices. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing them with us. My um, pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's really a pleasure to have you. Um, I think it goes without saying we both love you and your work. Thank you. And I honestly have to say that I feel like I need to get some strepicarpus after hearing you oh, talk about good. this so much. I'm so glad. I don't glad like that. African violets, but I think I need to expand my Gisneriad interest. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, if you're going to go, if you're going to go large on this, check out my Instagram for my recent picture of a Smithyantha. Smithyanthas okay. are amazing. I would that's that's the one I would really suggest that you go for if you like crazy colored foliage and kind of slightly gaudy flowers smithy okay. are amazing um Stephen's not a flower person but I definitely am well yeah. I mean the other thing is you can cut them you can just cut the flowers off if you don't like the flowers but um yeah it's it's an awesome one I'm trying to convert people one person at a time to gesneriads <laughs> do you have any good recommendations for one that stays sort of compact with pure white flowers um there if it well there's a lovely little um genus of because near ads called um petrochrosmias and they are they are actually quite like african violets dare i say it but they're a little rosette of tiny hairy leaves and they produce in the autumn these tiny little white flowers very delicate white flowers the favorite one of mine is petrochrosmia cryptica very easy to grow and they're really really sweet um, and then look at also, I'm just trying to think if there's a white primulina. I don't think there is. But again, uh, have a look at the Gisneriad Society website and um, start start poking around in the world of Gisneriads. And, and there's so many amazing hybrids being produced that there will be something that fits those criteria for you. So, yeah, that's my awesome. advice. I will check all of that out and see if I can get my hands on some of those. That sounds good. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking. It's been fantastic to meet you. And I hope the rest of your week goes nicely. Thanks. Thank you. So, Matthew, um, what are you going to do with those figs at home? Uh, how do you feel about them? Uh, you mean the ficus lorata that Jane, like, deliberately told us yeah. was awful? Um, Jane's on my side. I am going to throw them in the wood chipper immediately. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I personally love them, and I think they're fantastic. And basically... If Jane isn't recommending them to people, if that influences their choices, that just means that there's more figs for me. <laughs> no, but that's yeah. the right thing about houseplants is that everybody has their specific tastes and interests and we all want to engage in the hobby differently. So totally. all answers are valid. Was there... Temporary first? What was the first time? Oh. So, Stephen, uh, I know that you don't really tend to garden this way, but are there any plants that you would classify as ones that are challenging for you that you're going to continue trying because you just know that they're challenging? Hmm. Um, you know, I tend to not, I don't know. I think like many people, I kind of don't like being defeated, right? <laughs> when, when something <laughs> won't grow well for me, or if I've lost one, I do get, yeah, I, I do Emotionally feel... damaged. <laughs> Well, a little, but I feel challenged to try again and conquer it, maybe to a bad extent a little bit, right? So I can think of a couple plants like this. The, I've talked about this a, a few times on this podcast, but um, adeniums for me are really hard to grow the way I was growing it. Um, and I, that's one that I'm going to try again. So well, maybe that answers this question. And I've got to say, when we first started this podcast, we were talking about adenium, and I kind of feel like you were at the point where you were like, oh. been there, done that, I'm finished. Oh, yeah, I was at a breaking point. Yeah. So what so, turned that around? <laughs> so I lost one, and I was relieved. And I was like, you know what? Good. Um, this caudact is mushy. Mushy caudacts 
flopped right over, and I was like, all right, well, there's no saving you. Um, Cut and the I negativity felt, from your yeah, life. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was like, you know, this kind of gives me permission to not treat these others well, because like, hey, this one died. Now I know how I'm going to feel, and I'm going to feel indifferent and or happy, right? But um, I talked to somebody at the um, Cascade Seculent Society show a couple weeks ago. She was selling adeniums that she said she grows outdoors here. That's totally different than how I thought um, they could be grown. Well, that so, just highlights why it's important to talk to local growers. Yeah, totally. Conditions vary so yeah. much that what works here is not going to be the same as other areas where they'll thrive under completely different conditions. Yeah, and I thought I was adapting this grow information that I was reading correctly, and I guess I wasn't. <laughs> anyway, so she said that I can grow them outdoors. If it gets much below 40, just bring them in, you know, ease them into a dormancy by... Um, restricting their water, you know, a little bit and kind of inducing that dormancy. So I'm excited to try that. I've already, I've already started that process with the, um, the, I think I have two or three left at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's, that's one, um, that I am stubbornly, you know, trying to grow. How about you, Matthew? Um, so I feel like there are a lot of plants that I have tried and struggled with that has mostly come down to my own personal cultural parameters. Like I'll have a plant that I might have in slightly less light than it wants because like the space is so limited for those high light areas and I might not have great luck. And I'll kind of go one of two ways with that. I'll either stop entirely attempting to grow things like a lot of cactuses. I love cactuses, but I simply mm. don't have the light availability. Yeah. So I love them. They're great. But most of my cactus collection has dwindled. Like I have a couple of Echinopsis that are small enough for windowsills and I've had good luck with them. And I feel like I've had them long enough that they're good, but I'm not going to buy another Apuntia because that's my favorite genus of cactuses. And they just all atoliate and look awful for oh, me. Oh, you know what? I I want to change your mind on that. There well, are some amazing ones. We have local hardy ones. Oh, I know that. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, yeah you know, and, and I, I was here thinking that Matthew didn't have a lot of cacti because he tells this story where he stepped on one. You know, we've actually never bed. shared this story on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, and so. let, me, let, me, let me share my version <laughs> first, okay? And then you can pick up the pieces. Uh -huh. So he steps on it, and he, he allegedly threw it out his window. Okay, I'm going to be really generous and say allegedly. Matthew, what's... Um, you want broad to? strokes are right. So I have this plant, and when I bought it, I thought that it was like a true Apuntia, um, which are the prickly pear cactus for people mm -hmm. who don't care about the Latin names. And they're so cool. They're so beautiful. I picked this one up at a local uh, nursery, but it's actually a related genus of a single species. I think it's called like Brazilo Apuntia or something. Huh. And okay. in the wild, they actually grow into huge trees. Like they're giant trees with like woody trunks, but they have like those paddle shaped prickly spiny. Actually, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's a pretty common succulent that you'll come across. It's not always labeled as anything, but it's like a cute little prickly pear. And so the Apuntia tree, uh, which is... Stephen, do you have the name for that? I'm not sure I'm getting the right one. Well, this one's called Apuntia echios. I, it's probably not that one. I don't know. Anyway. It's, it's immaterial. But I had this plant, and as soon as I properly identified it, I was like... 50% less interested because it wasn't what I thought it was and I bought it specifically wanting like that prickly pear cactus flower eventually and when I saw what the flowers of this one looks like I was like well fuck if this thing dies it's totally fine so I had it growing on in front of my bedroom window I have like this this little bench that mm -hmm. runs the whole length of the window with some plants that are all stacked up and my bunnies will tend to go and nibble on any plants that are kind of at the level that they can reach. So the way that I got around this was by putting like my prickly spiny cactuses and euphorbia in that space that they could easily access because they were less interested in doing it if there were spines involved. So that was really successful. But then one night I get up to like pee in the middle of the night and somehow I end up knocking this plant over and on its way to the floor it like raked all of its spines down my leg and ankle and it landed on my foot and like filled my skin with hundreds of tiny little spines and 
you know, there was also soil and dirt and gravel everywhere. So insult to injury and mess on top of all of it. And so sometimes <laughs> I'm kind of prone to fits of rage. And that one happened where I just grabbed the plant, went out onto my balcony and just chucked it off into the street. Allegedly. And allegedly. Okay, listen. Yeah. Um, perhaps this is what occurred. That's right. And like, luckily... A lot of ambient... Yeah. Roseanne. I don't know what happened. Just like Roseanne. Yeah, I don't yep. know. Um, I, I didn't <laughs> okay. hate speech anyone, uh, yeah. but this yeah. cactus ended up in the middle of Madison Street, uh, middle of the night where there were no cars or people, and I felt much better. But then the next day, I had to Google some ways to get cactus spines out of skin when you can't even see them, and when they're tangled up in like leg hair to make it impossible to find. So I kind of swore off prickly cactus at that wow. point. Yeah. So that's kind of a good transition, right, into plants that we hate. Yeah. First, though, I just want to mention that there are plants that I find really challenging that I'll still continue to grow and almost treat as annuals indoors. I know that you have some Drosera that grow as annuals, so they're going to be a short-lived house plant. Mm -hmm. But I can never keep my gardenias happy inside. That is a plant that everybody knows, but, like, if you're familiar with them growing them you know that they hate being inside they like high humidity bright light lots of air movement and that's just mm. not great so i'll buy those regularly and replace them regularly kind of like you do with phalaenopsis orchids yeah that's interesting because for me the that's kind of like the adenium for me yeah like, if i had tons of heat tons of light i'm sure this would be great yeah and, and there's I, also some I, like i try my best but yeah, there's some outdoor plants that won't survive our winters, but I love them enough that I'll treat them like annuals, like the Mandevilla, which has beautiful red flowers that attract hummingbirds. Like, there's plenty of plants that I will give time, attention, and resource into, knowing that they won't be long-lived houseplants. Uh, but so, Stephen, I know that we both have very different IP, uh, ideas and opinions on good houseplants. Yeah, and listeners, I feel like we haven't really broached this very much yet. Have we? We've kind of hinted at it, or we've like... Well, there was this one Instagram giveaway that just made me giggle, because it was like, I don't really know what they were giving away, but their advertisement was Reuters and Suckers for people who are into aeroids and people who are into succulents. And I was like, haha, it's us! <laughs> so... Oh, uh, wow. yeah, I'm the Reuter and Steven's the sucker. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Steven, that joke do you mind, so. do you mind if I guess some houseplants that you hate? Um, yeah. And just let me say, like, listen, I don't hate people for liking these. I, oh yeah, we like have no judgment. It's these not like plants. that. It's just like, wait, in my home, in my care, that's the kind of what it, yeah. what this is going. Okay. So, okay. I'm going to start this category real broad and just say... <laughs> leafy foliage plants like tropical plants steven would never buy a monstera yeah, no. steven would never buy a calathea mm -hmm. steven would never buy a fern uh, <laughs> a weird fern yeah a fern that doesn't yeah. look like a fern e, probably not or even an earth plant yeah i like when i think of those things <laughs> i mean so i would say most aeroids i just think that they kind of have big leaves they all look fairly similar, and when I think about owning one, I'm thinking, like, do I need a separate light just for this one plant? And then all it's going to do is make a leaf? <laughs> and the okay. scale of So Steven's I clearly, plants, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it, and I don't, I'm not pretending I get it, but... Steven has so many plants, but they're all in, like, six mm -hmm. or fewer inches pots, and I think that... It would just yeah. be such a huge transition for him to oh. be expected to care for a full-size Monstera. Massive. Yeah, and I, I mean, so there's that one. What is it? Riff... Uh... Riffidophora tetrasperma. Yes, so that one I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, the mini Monstera. But uh, to me, when I think about that plant, I'm like, oh, you know, it climbs in an interesting way. The leaves are smaller, mm -hmm. so I feel like, you know, I can, I can have another plant and this plant. Um, and... Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and the urgency level is still pretty low. Yeah. Like, I've been kind of asking Matthew, I'm like, oh, if you have a cutting, 
And I've got like two huge ones, but they're growing on my wall. So I have to be very thoughtful about like, well, how am I going to cut some chunks up to propagate? Because I really want Stephen to have this plant. Yeah. And like, I'm just saying if I really wanted one, I would just have gotten one. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) They're kind of like, they're not that rare, but I know that he won't buy it himself. So I'm also going to put out there flowering plants. Like if I was to give Stephen a beautiful Cattleya orchid that bloomed once a year he okay. wouldn't care about the flowers. I, I was going to say orchids aside, but yeah, Cat Leah, I mean, eh, they're fine. Like, it, I feel like... If I got him any florist orchid, yeah, it would die and go in the um, compost pretty quick. That has happened. Like, yep. I received a Phalaenopsis as a gift. Um, I think I just put it outside. <laughs> like, but I was like, <laughs> oh, maybe this will be fine. And it wasn't. But I'm, I'm just in, staring like, blankly yeah, at him. Like, it... Eh, I like, I don't hate flowers um, or something, but I, I don't often grow plants for the point of their flowers, right? Like, I think many carnivorous plants, the flowers are sort of secondary, mm-hmm. um, I guess, you know, as to why people are growing them. Some orchids, I'm really interested in the in the flowers, like Bulbophyllum, I think there's a lot of really interesting flowers, and I try to get those to flower. Um, and people who aren't familiar with orchids... He is talking about ones that have small, not very ornamental flowers that you have to like look at closely to appreciate. They're absolutely yeah. amazing, but they're not it's, corsage orchids. It's true. So I feel like maybe for a flower person, these would not be they're not main event <laughs> flowers. Oh no. My gosh. Okay. I'm like hearing that and like you know taking that in for the first time. No, they are really cool though. It's um, just very different. Yeah. So I think the flowers that I am interested in, they tend to be kind of. Yeah, like like right now, I'm I'm curious to see if I, this Sapelia will bloom, and that one is kind of big and sort smells of like carrion. Yeah, it smells like rotting flesh, right? So it's kind of a different priority. I it's, mean, the, so I I had a Hoya bloom recently, and that's my first Hoya. That was yeah. cool to see, but the scent I'm like not into. But so Matthew's I, like, oh, I like it. Well, I was actually going to mention this because it's his first Hoya. He got it as a cutting. The cutting looked real sad, and I thought it was going to die. But sure enough, it put out a uh, peruncle, and now it's blooming, and Stephen's like, this just smells like funereal lilies. It looks really cool, though. So I actually kind of like the the flowers themselves. Well, they're like, in they, they the... They look really interesting. They're, they're, they're in the Aponaceae family, like mm. the Streptopalia, and like... So it's it's a unique, interesting flower that's not just this flamboyant, lurid thing. Um, but he doesn't care about the fragrant plants yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most cactus flowers, I mean, not caring. I mean, epiphyllum aside, like, yeah, anyway. Um, so I think it's tough. Like, a lot of plants people talk about, I am kind of not aware of, or I... He's not like, aware because he or, doesn't care. Well, yeah, or it's kind of like seeing baby pictures and you're like, oh, yeah, great, yeah. huh? Basically, um, but, if you, yeah, but yeah. I'm like, I, you know, I'm totally rooting for you on this different level. But if it's a you, plant that Home Depot you. sells, it's I, probably not on Stephen's wish list. I mean, yeah, because I feel like I, I just want to grow something I haven't seen before a little bit. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, I should be able to define this better and I'll work on that. But yeah. anyway. Okay. So, Matthew, plants you hate. Well, do you want to give a stab um, at them? Yeah, so I, I'll totally admit that we kind of talked about this beforehand because I was like, I can't think of very many individual specimens of plants that you hate. But That's kind of it's... the difference in our collections where like, I'll have a lot of diversity in things and mm-hmm. Stephen's very focused. So I admit, this is a little bit harder of a challenge for you. So yeah, but you said certain types of flowers and I think I could actually guess this. Mm-hmm. Like we talked a bit about it, but there's certain colors that I think he just wouldn't have in his home. Um, Hashtag aesthetic. Yeah, he did have a very kind of garish pink um pinguicula flower like incessantly right that plant would not stop blooming (laughs) and i hated the flowers and it was really like kind of a child's magic marker it was a color that is nowhere else in my apartment yeah like it didn't seem natural (laughs) but nature kept producing it on his on his shelf so i mean do you want to expound on that like is it certain colors of flowers that you're not into you know, I am a little bit picky about flower color. My favorite flower color is white. I just love white flowers. I think that you see their structure, their shape, their color. 
I'm not crazy on a lot of purple hues because I have no other purple in my apartment. Um, and actually, now that I'm saying this all out loud, I really do like how the flowers fit into an overall kind of look of a space. So white flowers go with everything. Yellow are beautiful, like little pops. Hmm. Um, reds and corals are fine, but when they start getting into like pinks, once it's past like kind of a millennial pink or like shell pink blush colors, I don't like them anymore. As soon as it's defined like as like a bright, vivid mm. pink color, my interest is gone. And I have let plants die if I get them, let them flower, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I hate this color. Because, mm. like, what's the point of having a hibiscus that I don't want to see the blooms? Okay. Yeah. So I'm very, very picky about that. And most of my plants have, like, the same kind of hue when they're in bloom. So what about this? Is there any aeroid that you're just, like you don't like or you're just over Ugh. so like within this category that you're otherwise enthusiastic about this is going to be controversial and we're going to oh, lose half of our listenership good. everyone's going to go and follow us on instagram and i'm going to start crying um okay. i hate variegated plants oh yeah there this i said it i much, said it this is much bigger I yeah. Forgot. yeah like there i have kind of come around on this a little bit but i think that plants that have yellow variegation are just unattractive. To me, I have never liked that, whether yeah. it's like a garden euonymus or like any of the variegated like shrubbery that you can have. I am real picky about that. I almost unilaterally hate them. I really... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I really do not like the, um, the pothos that has like the white splashes on the leaves. I actually have a golden pothos, but I intentionally grow it in low light so that the variegation just adds texture to my space, but it's not like vividly yellow. Plants that got me out of my pure hatred of variegation were calathea, which are not really variegated. Yeah, they just have colorful gonna, leaves. I was going to poke at that because yeah. I feel like that That's suggests different. variegation. Yeah, like the entry point to me for variegated plants is when the plant leaf has patterning. So I would not say that Anthurium clarinervium has variegated leaves. It has patterned leaves. Yeah, that seems different. To yeah, me. so yeah. I like patterned leaves. I have this really beautiful... Um, I think it's called Lipstick Vine. It's Black Pagoda. Um, mm. And it has, like, purple veining. I think that's stunning. And I have yeah. a lot of philodendrons that grow their new foliage in in so, different colors. So then what is it? Just this thought that... It's where the individual a... leaves are, like, blotchy with weird colors. So it's just you don't like the yellow. Yeah, like Thai Constellation Monstera, everyone wants one. And actually, I'm sorry, Jane. I know that you love your plants. I will never pay money for that. Even when they're $19 at Ikea in so, three years. And, you know, this betrays how little I know about these. So Thai Constellation is just the variegated one or is that the white one? It's a particular variegated one that has like white. Like, it, it's actually bright white and dark oh, green. Oh, yeah. See, I, I think that's interesting to look at, but I don't need it in my home. I would but never, for me, that's ever like, buy that plant. That's actually very positive. That's a plant that if somebody <laughs> bought it for me, I would be so thankful that somebody took the time to think of and buy a gift for mm -hmm. me, and I'd be so appreciative of it, and then I'd give it to someone else. And listen, like, this is remedial, I realize, but so when I look at that plant, I'm kind of like, okay, this is going to be kind of difficult to keep healthy right well, yeah because variegation means that the plant is less hardy yeah so that's what yeah. i i look at that and i'm kind of like oh m pretty or something like how difficult to keep that like well you get that all white leaf or whatever and you're just yeah. like oh shit some of the key problems with these variegated plants is that if they're chimeras where instead of the plant being like purely one genetic version of itself that it's growing all of its stuff together like the same way um like pink princess is a good example of this it's a chimera of two different plants and one of them is variegated and one of them is not so you can buy a pink princess philodendron and find that it just starts growing all pink leaves and you think this is wonderful it's so beautiful but they don't have enough chlorophyll so the overall vigor of the plant diminishes rapidly and it's not going to survive long term mm. on the flip side you might have a pink princess that you're like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's going to look amazing once the variegation grows in. But it's just reverted back to like one of the genetic 
plants that's in its yeah. genome and it's just gonna grow the regular like reddish green leaves so this is maybe a rabbit hole but what do you do to keep those alive uh well so you just bake it with light no like you're like oh other chlorophyll you work overtime like i don't think it works that way no it doesn't really it's sort of one of those like hit of the the draw and luck of the draw kind of things mm -hmm. and um I was actually listening to one of Jane Perone's episodes a couple of days ago where she was talking with a nursery grower who does not produce Pink Princess because even though they're really popular and they could make tons of money on them, if you grow like a thousand plants mm -hmm. and if only a fraction of those actually produce the variegated leaves but with enough other leaves that can support its growth they can't produce a viable crop to break even. Yeah. So that's where you're going to see the prices high because they're hard to produce, they're slow to grow, they revert or they go purely variegated. If you have like a Hoya carnosa that's variegated and it suddenly has like one long vining ivory colored shoot where all of the leaves are yellow green or like yellow cream, you're not going to have a vigorous plant because it's not able to produce its own food. So hmm. these are just problems that to me... <laughs> I just don't want to deal with them, and I don't like the aesthetic enough to try. Yeah. But with that said, I do like some very good plants, like the uh, the Hartley philodendron. Uh, there's a cultivar called Brazil that has kind of yellow and chartreuse and dark green foliage. I think that that looks very beautiful, like it's mm. been painted. So I'm a little bit picky about my variegation, but I'm never going to spring money for a plant that is priced more highly because of its variegation. Wow, okay. Don't like the aesthetic. Yeah. So yeah, do we have anything more to say about hatred? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're in such a negative space. Yeah. Do we want to hang out here? Well, other plants that I have enjoyed but won't grow again, Jasminum sandback, the Arabian jasmine. It's always beautiful in the summer, and it always perishes in the winter. So which one is that? It's the the one that you can find, like, cuttings sprouted. It's usually being sold at, like, Swanson's Nursery next to their African violets, another plant I don't deal with. And they bloom lovely flowers that only last a day, and they fall off. But it's the variety that they use to make, like, jasmine tea or jasmine rice. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the flowers are very fragrant. You can use them in your own tea, but I've just given up on that plant. The payback is not nearly high enough for either the cost of replacing them regularly or the trouble of keeping one individual plant happy long enough to like mm -hmm. continue doing its thing reliably. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other plants that I just don't participate with yeah, anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I've been so kind of disappointed in something, you know what I mean, that I won't pick it up again ever, I think. Because, I mean, even that those deniums I was, you know, complaining yeah. about, I'm kind of already back. And then there's, you know, things that I, I don't really like, but it's just I'm more, honestly, like, strongly indifferent than, like, me actively hating them. Well, know? and I think the part of that is because you've never had an interest in maiden hair ferns, so you've never bought a maiden hair fern. <laughs> yes, I yeah. never have. That is a plant that I actually have several that are doing beautifully on my balcony because they are native species that live outdoors here yeah. and they grow beautifully. If I bring any kind of like tropical or sensitive ones indoors, they will just perish and I don't like mm -hmm. their appearance nearly enough to tolerate that kind of diva quality out of a plant. I'll yeah. do that with some things, but not a maidenhair fern. Um, but on the fern topic, I'm glad that Jane mentioned them because I happen to love some ferns. I like the ones that are a little bit more coarse textured with like glossy, shiny leaves. So I've been doing some research because I really want to get something that looks like a Boston fern, but that's one that is really, really going to need humidity. They're really prone to dropping all of their leaves if you let them dry. And honestly, I let my plants get dry sometimes, even ones that I shouldn't. And I just don't want to deal with a plant that is that messy and that particular. So I was doing some research, and there are two really promising species that I'm going to be keeping an eye out for to give ferns another go. One of them is one that we can grow outdoors here. It's called the Japanese holly fern, and they grow these long arching leaves that are very coarse textured. It's a really like kind of large scale they're that shiny, they're glossy. Yeah. yeah, I actually have one of those also growing on my balcony, but I want one indoors for a hanging pot. And I'm actually going to get one for Miles because there's a few of them in stock at the Seattle plant store. So I'm going to go pick one up. 
Um, but then the other one is a related species to the the Boston fern, and it's called the macho fern, which I actually just love that ridiculous name. But it's also a nephrolopsis species, and it has also kind of coarse textured foliage, but it's a little bit more fine and delicate than the, the Japanese holly fern. And this is one that people typically have really good luck indoors with. They're much less sensitive to drying and low humidity, and I'm kind of excited to give those ones a try. But if I fail, I might just say, like, fuck ferns and mm -hmm. stick with my platycerium and my bird's nest ferns and just call that a day. Yeah, ferns for me, I just feel like I need a totally different setup. I need humidity. I need the perfect corner. I need... They're also totally like not your aesthetic. I, honestly, I don't dislike them. I kind of like the sort of fragile look when sort of this... I think the texture is really nice. Mm -hmm. They have actually some beautiful stems as well, like these yeah. like deep blacks. Well, that's the nice thing about maidenhair ferns is that they have that really beautiful wiry stem with the light airy foliage on top. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the ferns that I had totally forgotten about until just now that I really love though is one of the microsorum species. It's the crocodile fern. And we might have mentioned this on earlier episodes, but it's growing on my coffee table and really doing pretty well with very minimal care in a medium humidity low light area. Uh, you've seen this plant, right? Yeah. Uh, what I love about it is that it has just a single long kind of lance shaped leaf that's kind of rippled and wavy. It's sort of a bright apple green, but it has uh, like a veining that's kind of irregular and it looks like a crocodile. And mm -hmm. that's a really great fern that I'm pretty fond of. Nice. So yeah, it looks like there might be more ferns out there that if I just apply myself, I can have some success with, <laughs> but I'm still not going to grow another Rex begonia. Yeah. So... so Steven, is there anything else that you want to mention? I don't think so. Um, this has been Plant Daddy Podcast. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And thanks so much to Jane for coming on. I really enjoyed the chat. Matthew yeah. did too. We really appreciate the time that you spent with us today. Yeah. Um, definitely check out her podcast if you haven't. I'm sure you have. You probably have. Um, if you haven't, you're not a plant daddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So please don't forget to go on to iTunes or whatever you use to view and listen to your uh, podcasts and give us a five star rating if you like what you hear it really helps other people find us when we get those comments and reviews yeah find us anywhere on social media at plant daddy podcast and please reach out if you want my mother's rex begonia okay yeah um, it's quite a nice plant that yeah, we don't want i don't want it all right so really i'm <laughs> sending it to you yeah okay so we're looking forward to you tuning in next time thank you so much for listening thank you jane and happy growing bye